Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Tanya and You, Chapter 22. Good to see you all, Boker Tov. And um, I have to apologize for my voice. I hope you're able to hear me. Kind of uh, lost my voice a little bit over the last few days. But um, I think we can still make it through the class. Okay, so we're in Chapter 22 of Tanya. This is in the in the thick. We're in the thick of things as the Tanya develops and amazing um, ideas of how to connect with God. And chapter twenty two is a direct continuation from chapter twenty and twenty one. So let's just uh, bring us up the uh, bring bring us up to speed uh, for a moment. So in the last few chapters, starting with chapter eighteen. We were discussing this innate love, connection, bond that we have with God, which we call it the hidden love. And when we say love, love over here in this context means connection. Wanting to do anything for this thing that I love. So in the context of God, do whatever God wants me to do out of love. We call it the hidden love because it's a love that's part of our nature that we're born with, but it's hidden. In other words, it's not necessarily in the forefront. It is revealed in times of crises when our big beliefs in God is uh, is questioned. Do you do you believe in God or not? Are you a Jew or are you not a Jew? Then we say no, absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes I'll be ready to, I'll be willing to give up my life for my Judaism. But on the day-to-day grind, eh, not necessarily. I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about my connection with God. And the question was, how do we live by this hidden love? How do we allow this hidden love to be on the front burner, to be in our consciousness? Every moment, with every decision that we make. So in order to answer that question, in chapter 20, 21, and now in 23 and 22, we develop this idea of what it means to believe in God. Because when it comes to faith in God, that's that, that's a big one. That's a big one. And I'm willing to die for that. I'm willing to stand up for that. But... What does it mean that I believe in one God? This belief that I'm willing to die for, what is it? What exactly is this belief that I'm willing to, to give up my life for? So we started explaining how really, I mean, the, the, the goal of this explanation is to get to the idea that ultimately one God means that in every decision that we make, we believe <clears throat> That ultimately everything is an extension of God. There's no other. There's no separate identity, entity. And therefore, every decision has to be with that in mind that this is ultimately believing in one God. But to get to that, we started talking about how the world, the, the, the nothingness of the world, the insignificance of the world in God's eyes, from God's perspective, we spoke about one word. What is the significance? What is the value of one word compared to the to the essence of the soul? Compared to the potential of speech? Compared to the words the way they are in in, in our in our uh, mental awareness and our emotions? It's insignificant. The world is insignificant in God's eyes. But then we took this a step further in the next chapter and said, no, it's not just it's insignificant. It's non-existence. And from God's perspective, it's all God in different forms. It's all an extension from God. Because speech, in our uh, lexicon, when we say speech, it means revelation and a, a separate entity that leaves my uh, being and goes out into the world and it's able to enter its own else's uh, being. 
But God, there's no other space other than God. So when we say speech, we don't mean that there's something separate from God. We mean speech within himself. It's a revelation. Like communication is a revelation. So when God spoke the word and the world was created, it was all within himself. So in other words, the 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 good and the evil, the good and the bad, everything in this world, even the areas of the world that seem to be antithetical to, God, to godliness, it's covering up godliness. It's the opposite of godliness. That is also God. We use the analogy of a turtle that hides in his own shell. Is it really hiding? No, it's not hiding. The face perhaps is hiding, but it's hiding in itself. And so too, that God, so to say, hides within the world, but the world that is hiding God is also God. Now we said, in general, Tanya is not meant to be a deep philosophical discussion. It's meant to be practical. So whatever philosophy we have in Tanya is always to circle back to, okay, so what does this mean for me? So we're not going to get too carried away in the philo philosophical ideas over here, but, it, but but chapter 21, 22 is quite philosophical. It's deep. It's deep, the chapter. So we want to, so we want to give the gist, the gist of the chapter to get the understanding of what the message, what the idea of the Tanya is trying to relay in chapter 22. So in chapter 22, we take this from our perspective. In other words, chapter 20 and 21, we're talking about from God's perspective, how God sees things. Now, ultimately, it's just an extension of God. Chapter 22 says, well, how do we see it? How do we perceive this? We look at the world, and we see, you know, a word that the uh, what the Kabbalah talks about, uh, klipa, which we mentioned right in the beginning of Tanya, which means basically anything that covers over godliness. There's evil. There's negativity. There's ideas. There's people. There are things. There are situations that seem to be, like we said, totally the opposite of God, antithetical to God. There's evil. There is. The devil, there is uh there's negative forces. And I believe most people will tell you, maybe other religions as well, that they'll tell you that there's God, there's the there's divinity, there's goodness, there's godly actions, there's godly ideas, and then there is the devil, then there is evil, then there is the Satan, then there is things that are totally devoid of godliness. That makes sense in our minds, right? We 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 we, we could uh we 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 could uh you know comprehend that. But Tanya is telling us no, everything is godliness, including all the evil, including all the negativity, all the areas in life which seem to be antithetical to godliness. That is also godliness. That's also God. Right, like we said, Hashem Echad, there is one God. Doesn't mean there's one and no, and, and and there isn't two. But that all, there is only God. Everything is all godliness. We say in our morning prayers that God creates light and darkness. Light and darkness are both the same God. Back in the day, people used to think that there's the God of light. And the God of Darkness, two different gods, can be the same God. The opposite from each other. How could they be? How could be the same God? And the Tanya says, no, it's the same God. There's one God. The darkness itself also comes from God. And how is that? How is that? That's where we have the Kabbalistic idea of tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is a contraction, concealment where God had to conceal himself. Like, you put up a curtain. It's not as sunny as before, right? We conceal our, ourselves. We have an idea, and you want to dumb it down. You want to give a, an analogy, a parable. 
So the, the, the depth of the idea is, is concealed within the parable, right? So there are many <coughs> analogies to this concept of concealment, symptom. So the reason why in certain areas in life you say, wow, this is godly. This is a manifestation of God in this world. That's great. In certain areas, you say, well, really? Where is God in this room? You come to a room where everyone is smiling and everyone's happy and everyone's caring for each other. There's socializing, there's camaraderie, there's caring, there's unity, there's love. Ah, oh, what a godly environment. What a godly environment. I'd love to come back. This is great. And but then you walk into a different room and you feel like no one's looking at each other. No one cares for each other. There's infighting. There's politics. There's anger. There's animosity. There's jealousy. And you come out of that room and say, I don't feel God in that room. God is missing. There's no divine light. And Tanya tells you that although that may be your feeling, and maybe in the world of revelation, one is godly, one isn't. But ultimately, everything comes from God. Even the areas that seem to be void of God, empty of God, or even the opposite of God. It's negative. It's prohibitions. It's right going against God. That itself is also God. God is there in a concealment. Simtsum. God is concealed. But God is everywhere. So may you, so you may ask. The next part of the time, the next part of the chapter asks an important question. And the question is, why? Why would God do that? Why would God create something, allow something in his world that stands up against it? Why would you fund your enemy? Right? Right. In other words, if you believe that there's the God of good and then there's the God of evil, two different gods, okay, makes sense. But it's the same God. The same God. He's bipolar. Is he good or is he bad? So the Tanya in this chapter talks about the idea of inner will and outer will. What does that mean? When you want to do something, where does it begin? So we're having a discussion in the family. Let's go on a vacation, right? I'm on a vacation. So what are we going to do? We're going to go to the Bahamas. Now, where does it begin? This idea of going to this vacation. Or if it's, I want to be successful and I want to go to medical school and get a degree. Or I want to come and invent a new uh, item and whatever, whatever it is. Where does it begin? It all begins with desire, with my will. I want something. And what do I want? I want the end goal, right? So let's say it's a vacation. What comes to my mind first? What do I want? I want to be on the beach with a nice cold drink, reading a book, a beautiful sunny day, having a great time. That's what I want. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Now, I know that I can't just snap my finger and I'll be there. There's a lot I have to do to get there. What do I have to do? I have to make arrangements. I have to get air to airfare. I got to book this. I have to buy that. They got to get into a taxi. I got to take a flight. They got to travel. All, all the schlep. Everything for what? For that moment that I'm, that I originally wanted. So there's this desire, but then there are so many other things I have to do to get to that desire. Now, when I'm waking up at 4 a.m. to get into my Uber at 5.30, to get to the airport. Do I want to wake up early and, and step into the Uber that early? Do I want to do that? Well, if I don't want to, why am I doing it? No one's forcing me. 
I want to because it's a means to an end. I know that in order to get to the end, what I ultimately want, I also have to do so, so many other steps. But that's not ultimately what I want. So I, there's wanting, and then, but then there's wanting. There's the inner will, and then what we call the external will, the outer will. Things that I want to do, not because I care for it, but only because it brings me to what I really want. So I have this big company. I have this big company. And I have a lot of employees. What do I want from this company? I want to make money. I want it to be successful. I care for the idea of whatever I'm selling. But then I also have janitors. Why do I have janitors? Because I need janitors in the office. I have to I have to live, I have to work out of a clean environment. So I'm paying my janitors. Now, do I want to pay my janitors? Of course I want to pay my janitors. But not because I not because for my company, I feel like, you know what? We, we really need good janitors. It's because I know that without janitors that we can't get our work done. Right? So The same is true with the same is true with um, with, uh, with 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 God and creating the world with God and creating the world. God had a purpose, had a desire, had a will to create this world. Why? Because God wanted that the human beings, you and me should follow in his ways, should do a mitzvah, should study his Torah, to make the world a better place, should help each other out, to bring, bring divinity, bring godliness down here in this world. That was his desire. And that is what we call the inner desire. No, well, he truly wanted. But God knows that in order to get there, there's a, the world needs many, many things. There's a whole world out there. Lots of things happening every moment. But all these other things that are happening, including the negativity, are all there because it's needed as you need janitors in an in, in office building. He doesn't care for it as he cares for what truly the world was created for. It's, it's, it's a means for an end. It's needed there in order to, 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 to reach its ultimate, ultimate purpose of creation. I was at a bar mitzvah recently here in the community. And I was watching and I was involved with, you know, the prep for this bar mitzvah. The weeks and weeks of fines and, and, and figuring things out and the invitation list and the arrangements. And the, right, a lot goes in to make this nice bar mitzvah. And then at the night of the bar mitzvah, there was, there was a moment that I was like, oh, oh, this is what it's worth for. This is what it's all worth. This is what it's for. At one point, the father gets onto the dance floor and says, come, come dance with me. People came, and then they had this joyous dance. Bar Mitzvah boy, it was a wonderful, wonderful like scene to see. Wow, proud father, so excited, dancing on the day of his son's Bar Mitzvah. And I was thinking, it was all worth it. The weeks and weeks and months of preparation and all the bills and everything that has to go into a range to make this beautiful Ramissa for that moment where he could sit, he could get onto the dance floor and dance with his son on Ramissa the day. Right? So at the end of the Ramissa, the father is taking out his checkbook and he's you know writing, you know, paying all the bills. He had this bill and that bill. Does he want to pay the bills? Who wants to pay bills? I don't want to pay bills. But you pay bills because you have to pay bills. Do I pay bills with the same excitement that I that I uh, dance with my son on the bar mitzvah? Of course not. Well, I want to do both. I want to pay bills and I want to dance with my son on the bar mitzvah. But of course, one of them is what I'm living for. This is what I'm here for: to dance with my son on the bar mitzvah day. And the other is a means to an end. In order to allow me to dance with my son on the bar mitzvah day, I need to pay my bills. So. With God is the same way. God wanted that there should be many areas in life where are devoid of godliness. <clears throat> Why is that? Because free choice. 
God wants us to make decisions in life. There's a value to, 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 that we make decisions. It's no decision when it's obvious, when there's no challenge, when there's no struggle. It's not a decision, right? Do I take, do I choose a million dollars or do I choose uh, a, bag, a bag of sand? It's not a decision, right? It's so obvious. A decision is when it's not so obvious. And that's what God wants. God wants to challenge us. Therefore, there is klipa in this world. There is negativity in this world. Because this is what God needs in order for him to appreciate our deeds, our good deeds, and our, our mitzvahs and our connection to God. So, does God love it? Does God, is he excited with it? No. But it's there for, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary evil, as we say. God, God needs it. God needs it. We use the analogy of, you know, when I pay this bill, when I don't want to, but I do it anyways. It's like throwing money behind my back. I have to do it. I have to do it, so I do it. But there's no heart. There's no excitement. I'm not involved in it. I'm doing it because I have to do it. Where am I involved? Where do I feel that this is me? This is exciting. This is exciting. This is what I want to do. Is when I'm uh, you know, dancing with my son. You know, doing something I really want. And the same is true. Where is God felt most? God has felt most in the areas that he enjoys. When we follow in his ways. In the other areas of life. The Kalipa. There. God is there, but God's hidden. He's hidden. It's, it, 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 you know, he, 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 doesn't, he, he doesn't feel at home over there. They even use the analogy of like a parasite, where the Kalipa, the forces of Kalipa, they get their energy. They get their energy from God, but they are using it against it. You're right. If you're agnostic, if you're atheistic, but you're living by God, you're getting your energy, your vitality, your life is from God, but you're taking it and using it against God. But God allows it. God allows it. Now, we use the analogy that God is almost like an exile over there because it doesn't feel at home. This is not what we enjoy. It's not what he wants. He wants only because he knows there's a need for it, but he doesn't really want it. So the the, 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 the Tanya at, at the end of the chapter you know, wraps this all up and says, this is what we call idolatry, right? Oftentimes, when we think of idolatry, we think of an idol, that bowing to an idol, or believing in another god. But what is truly the psychology of, of, of idolatry? What's the idea behind idolatry? It's really a mindset. It's not about what we do, it's how we think. It's a mindset of idolatry. So, based on how we understand one God, the opposite of that is idolatry. So, if one God means there isn't two gods, so idolatry means I believe in a second God. If one God means that all of creation, all of it is all God, including the clip, including the negative forces, including the areas that we seem to be empty of God, that's also godliness. If that's what one God means, so what's idolatry? Idolatry is believing that there are that there are areas in life that are devoid of God. If I believe that this area is not God, that is idol worship. Because what I'm saying is that there's a certain space where, where God is not there. The Talmud says something fascinating. The Talmud says that the person who is arrogant, a person who has arrogance, is like an idol worshiper. Really? Well, arrogance? I mean, okay, it's not an oh, idol worshiper. So what's arrogance? Arrogance is saying that there's, there's me, there's a space where there isn't God, right? If I believe that there's God within me, I wouldn't be arrogant. <laughs> and arrogant means that I am... I am separate from anyone else, from, from anyone else and from God. I feel myself. Feeling yourself as a separate entity, which brings to arrogance, that is a form of, of idol worship. 
It's a, what I'm saying is that there's a space where there's no God. So idolatry at its root is feeling as a separate entity from God. So idolatry doesn't have to be denial of God. Idolatry could also be that I believe in something else other than God. I believe in myself as a separate entity of God. There is the I want, the I feel, the I need. That is, if that's not, if that's not coming from like, because I need to serve God, therefore I need it. It's more like I need it because I need it. I want it. I feel it. It's all about me. You're touching in a very sensitive, you know, yeah, it's very, uh, you know, uh, getting, it's a fine line, whether it's idolatry or not. Now, we're using obviously idolatry not in the halakhic term, the term by the idea, the idea to know that there's a me and then there's a God, that's a form of idolatry. And that's what the Tanya is arguing over here. And this is something that is on a daily decision to make when when we're faced with the dilemma, and the question is, I can do what's right because I know this is what God wants. But then there's but then there's what I want, what feels good for me. And if it, and that's a decision between God and something opposite of God. So these are decisions. These are idolatrous. These are decisions of, do I believe in one God? And we'll, and we'll develop this in the next chapter how how it means practically. But this is what the idea that the time is is, is developing over three chapters. If we understand the world is all God, even the negativity is God, even the clipa is God. And believing in one God means that I realize that every single area of my life is, is filled with God. And believing in you know in, in, in an idol, in, in idol worship, is, is not just thinking of I'm, I'm, I'm serving another God. I'm serving a, a, another, another entity. That is really the, the idea of the chapter. Just to conclude with the story, with uh, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Schellenberg Gordon. He's actually, for those of you who uh, know New Orleans, Rabbi uh, Rifkin, Rabbi Zelig Rifkin's wife, Mrs. Bluma Rifkin. Her uh, this is a story with her father. Her father was Rabbi Schellenberg. He's a rabbi in uh, I forget the name of the city in New Jersey, and uh, he's going a rabbi going back in the fifties and the sixties. And there was a couple. There was a family, a Jewish family from his community, who owned a a retail uh, men's clothing store. And uh, quite successful, and they had a uh, a son who was of marriageable age, and they were having trouble with him finding the right, you know, right match, the right shidduch. He was getting older, and they were getting nervous. So uh, they spoke to Rabbi Gordon about it, and Rabbi Gordon said, "Okay, I think you might want to come with me to the Rebbe in New York, and ask for a blessing." That's for a blessing. Okay. So they came with Rabbi Gordon to the Rabbi's office for a private audience. And they came with a check because they knew you come to Rabbi, you got to give a donation. And in their mind, they're going to give a donation, get the blessing, and move on. And so they sit down and they have the check. They say, Rabbi, this is a donation for your, for your work. We'd like to have a blessing for our son that have to find the shidduch, to find the match. The Rebbe starts asking questions. Where do you live? What do you do for a living? Oh, you have a clothing store. <clears throat> when is the clothing store open? What are the hours? They say it's opened six days a week. We're closed on Sunday. So the Rebbe said, what about Shabbos? Oh, Shabbos were open. We have to be open on Shabbos because it's the busiest day, you know, who when are men coming to buy a suit? They're coming on Shabbos. That's when they're coming. They're not coming during the week. So the Rebbe says, you know, ultimately God provides. And God tells us to close on Shabbos. It's not going to affect your uh, your business. In fact, the Rebbe says, if you close, if you commit to close your store on Shabbos, then I'll give you a blessing for your son to have a shidduch. They weren't, they weren't taking that. And he says, you know what? We didn't really come to talk about our story. We really came to talk about our son. And in fact, maybe we'll give you even a larger donation. And so we'll, we'll, we'll double the check, we'll give you a larger donation, and you know we want the blessing. They obviously don't know who they're talking to. They thought you know money is going to bring out a blessing out of, out of nowhere. So the Rebbe says, it's not about the money. 
I really think that I, I see that the blessing for your son is coming through your Shabbos observance and we're closing the store. So they tell the Rebbe, how about this? How about give us the blessing? If or and once our son gets engaged, then we'll close the store on Shabbos as a thank you to God. So listen to this. The Rebbe tells them, and maybe God thinks the opposite of that. Maybe God wants the opposite. In other words, maybe God wants you to first close the store and then you'll, you'll see that you see that blessing. The end of the story was that they actually, unfortunately, did not listen to the Rebbe. They did not close their store. And a few years went by, the son was not able to get married. Eventually, there was some type of uh, fire in the store and they had, you know, they had an insurance claim and basically they decided that it wasn't worth it to it was worth it to just take the money from the claim and they closed their store they ended up closing their whole store a few days after they closed their store their son got engaged <laughs> but the point is the point is sometimes we say we tell God well I'm going to make a decision that makes sense for me it's easier for me it feels better for me and God, you know what? Maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pay you back. You know, if you're if you're good to me, I'll be good to you. Maybe God thinks the opposite. Maybe God wants to see you first make decisions for God, and then He'll give you, He'll, 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 He'll pay you. In other words, in every decision that we make, if we're thinking about self, then eh, that's a problem. If we're thinking of the, there's a place where God isn't involved. We're thinking about what does God want? That means I believe in one God. So that's the gist of chapter 22. And uh, it's a little deep, a little philosophical. There's more to read inside if you'd like. But um, that's uh, that's the gist of the, of the chapter. Tra chapter 23 and 24, we take this on a practical. So what does this mean practically now that we have, we have a much better understanding? Uh, quick announcement. Next week is the holiday of Shavuos. It's Tuesday night, Wednesday, and Thursday, so um, we won't be giving, we, we won't have class, no class next Thursday because of the holiday. We should be able to continue two weeks time, but not next week. And um, for those of you who are here in New Orleans, we encourage you to please join us on the holiday of Shavuos. Tuesday night we have an all night program on Wednesday at eleven a.m. The reading of the Ten Commandments, followed by ice cream party and a dairy lunch. If you're not able to make it in the morning at 11, there's going to be a second reading of the Ten Commandments at 6 p.m. with some dairy refreshments here at Chabad Menuhi. We'd love to see you then. Thank you for joining us.